Hello puppies and kittens, I'm Aaron Ra. If you've already seen a few of my videos, then you will have already heard me saying everything I'm about to say again. But I'm trying to reach out to a new audience, a wider audience of believers this time, by answering one of their videos asking 10 questions of atheists. The worldview discussions space can be so combative. And when atheists and Christians come up with lists of questions that they don't think the other side can answer, those questions usually aren't genuine. I've never made a list like that, although I've responded to some. Here, I hope my atheist interlocutors will consider these questions deeply without giving glib answers. These aren't meant to be gotcha questions, though I'm not asking for no reason. I expect you will have answers, and I want to hear what the most sincere among you have to say. With that, here are my 10 questions for atheists. What facts about reality that you and I agree are real facts about the way the world is, does your worldview account for, but my Christianity doesn't account for, or at least doesn't account for well? And for those of you that would point out atheism isn't a worldview, I'm talking about you, your worldview that includes atheism. I can't think of any. Christianity accounts for evil, suffering, the existence of other religions, including supernatural events in those other religions, science, and differences among different denominations of Christianity. But I can think of many things that the most common worldviews that include atheism don't answer as well as I think Christianity does. Like universal supernatural claims, universal religious experiences, free will, morality, near-death experiences, beauty, the rapid expansion of the early church, the events surrounding the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth, and our shared longing for purpose and meaning. So what is it that Christianity doesn't answer as well as your worldview? The Christianity doesn't have any answers, not even bad ones. Atheism doesn't either, as it's not a worldview. We get our answers from science, mathematics, or philosophy. Christianity doesn't have a source for answers. Y'all always say that Jesus is the answer, but not to any question I can think of. Your one explanation for everything is God did it, but what is that answer? Christianity doesn't and can't answer anything. It doesn't explain anything either. Let's go down your list, starting with evil. Christianity doesn't explain why there is evil. Neither did the previous religion to come before Christianity. Judaism says that God creates both good and evil, that he forms the light and creates darkness. He brings prosperity and creates disasters. That's just a story from a different religion than Christianity, and it's not an answer. Nor does it explain why God himself is evil. I mean, he's not pure evil. The Jewish father God is supposed to be both good and evil, so not everything he does in whatever scripture is always entirely evil, but most of it is. There's no balance there, no yin and yang. We cannot say that God is love because there's no real love there. The character of God is that of a grotesquely cruel and abusive narcissist, full of vanity, jealousy, genocidal vengeance, and merciless eternal rage, the very embodiment of evil. The Bible God is overwhelmingly evil, and he was like that from the beginning. Look at the trap he baited and set for Adam and Eve, a couple who, because they didn't know good from evil, they couldn't fairly be held culpable. But God is not a righteous judge. So he punished them anyway. And he lied to them about what the punishment would be. There are other parts of the Bible where God not only lies, but he brags about it. And the book of Job is actually a worse indictment of God than every evil thing he ever did in Genesis, even with the worldwide flood and destruction of Sodom and all of that. What he did at the Tower of Babel alone is inexcusable. And that's if you read the Bible literally, of course, and no one reads the Bible more literally than an atheist because we don't have to apologize for it to justify or excuse or rationalize away any of the absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions therein. We view God, at least the Bible God, as just a character in a story, such that even if there was a God, a real God, it wouldn't be this God. This one is fictitious. Because the Bible is at least mostly false, if not entirely so. And the God that the sacred fables describe is definitely predominantly evil. Neither Christianity nor Judaism can explain why. I think it is. 
that uh, the, the people who made up these stories also created God in their image, which is why he is just as racist, sexist, superstitious, and stupid as they were. Again, read the book of Job, where we see that God is an idiot. Now let's look at suffering. And Christianity doesn't even attempt to explain suffering. Judaism at least tried to with the fable that God cast a magical curse on the first people, but that doesn't account for the fact that all those, those people already needed to eat. Sin did not bring death into the world because the scripture says that we were created as animals, meaning that we have to ingest and digest living organisms in order to survive. And for those who say that fruit is not a living organism, of course it is. And if it is not, then it was a living organism that has now died. Same for whatever vegetables we try to eat. So death already existed, and Adam needs to eat something or else he would die too. God said that Adam could eat the fruit of any tree of the garden, but there were two particular ones that he was to choose from. It was a choice between two options because it's obviously metaphorical. The story is clearly a fable with a moral. Uh, to eat of the fruit of means to uh, the res it refers to the result of choices made or actions taken the authors never intended that we should read this literally like so many people do today you miss the point of the story if you do adam was told not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because then he would realize that he was naked because the storytellers who made up this tale thought that being naked was evil and that shows how little the myth makers understood of morality because that means that being as God made you is evil. And therefore, if God made you naked, then he made you evil and stupid, or at least amoral, since Adam and Eve didn't know that they were naked slash evil. But that wasn't the only magically enchanted tree in the mythical garden. Adam was given a choice that he could eat instead of the fruit of the tree of eternal life. And if he ate from that tree, then he would live forever. I'd like to ask believers what they think would have happened if Adam never ate from either tree. Because if he doesn't eat from that tree, then he's not going to live forever. He will eventually die. But believers never figure that out. So I have to be more explicit. I asked them to explain what would happen if Adam never ate anything at all. Do they understand that he would then suffer from starvation? God could have given us the ability to make our own food like plants do. He could have given ourselves chloroplasts along with mitochondria, but he didn't. And consequently, we have to find something living to eat or else we suffer by God's original design. So Christianity doesn't explain evil or suffering, and neither does Judaism. Nor has any religion ever adequately addressed the Epicurean quandary. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? This quandary was posed 2,400 years ago, about the time that the myth of the Garden of Eden was being adapted for the Bible, in a time before Christianity even existed. Yet that quandary remains unresolved to this day. So Christianity doesn't explain evil or suffering. Certainly can't explain the existence of other religions either, many of which already existed long before Christianity did, with scriptures that were already completed before the first books of the Bible were even begun. And some of those ancient scriptures were presented as the absolute truth and the revealed word of the one true God, even though they can't agree on which God that's supposed to be. Christianity cannot account for supernatural events in all these other religions either, especially not those tropes that Christianity borrowed from older religions and then adapted into their own lore, where other half-human godmen had already done this or that in other religions before your alleged Christ did the same, and not as well, I might add. I've encountered Hindus who say that they are the ones with the true consciousness of God, while Christians are deceived by demoniac forces. And you all say the same about them, as if your explanation of them is any truer than their description of you. Neither of you can show that you're right about anything. And all the world's religions combined can't even show that there's a there there, that there is a supernatural at all. And the reason is because the real explanation, 
is that there is no supernatural, but that some people are credulous and some are illusionists and faith is inherently autodeceptive, causing every faithful believer to be convinced of their own supernatural visions and such. I was once a neo-pagan spiritualist myself once upon a time. and I was invested in transcendental meditations and other occult practices, so I know how deceptive faith can be. Christianity certainly cannot explain science because faith and science are polar opposites. Scientific methodology is designed to minimize or eliminate biases where religion is a bias by definition. In science, all postulations must be testable and potentially falsifiable and based on indicative evidence. But faith means believing impossible nonsense for no good reason, asserting baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact, and pretending to know things you don't know and then refusing to admit when you were always wrong all along. Sure, the Enlightenment began in Christian countries, so many famous scientists once upon a time were Christian, but those scientists knew that they could only perform science so long as it didn't threaten Christian beliefs. Some of those scientists complained about that, or they were punished by the church for being too scientific. Sure, the Bible says, test all things and hold fast to that which is good, but then you also have a limit imposed by Jesus himself where he says, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Of course, Christianity can't explain the differences between different denominations either, which led to Mormons killing Protestants, and Protestants killing Catholics, and Catholics killing Orthodox, and Puritans torturing Quakers after the Puritans had fled from the Anglicans, to say nothing of the Coptics and Luciferians and other Christian cults that were crushed by other denominations. If any of these people really had the personal relationship with Jesus that they all pretend, then none of this would or could happen, nor would there even be different denominations. And if there really was a God, then there wouldn't be all these different religions either, all threatening their own punishments for dedicating their lives to the wrong version of God. Have you noticed that Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all based on the same God of loving, forgiveness, and peace, and wisdom, yet they've all been at war with each other, each since their inception. So there is nothing at all that Christianity answers as well as secular science and or humanist values and atheist philosophy. For example, in your second list, we were supposed to be talking about facts and reality that we can both agree are real facts about the way the world is, but your second list includes things that are not facts at all like the highly dubious claims about the alleged life and obviously embellished death of Jesus, and free will, which probably doesn't exist in reality and cannot logically exist in a religion that believes in prophecy, and your longing for purpose and meaning that I do not share. The way I see it is, if you want your life to have purpose, then you must decide what you want that purpose to be, and you must work to that end. I did, but I went through much of my life with no purpose at all, and I was perfectly happy with that. I've already shown in previous videos, evolution actually provides a better explanation than any religion ever could for morality and for our appreciation of beauty and even for universal religious experiences and supernatural claims. Except for the alleged near-death experiences. That one is cultural. When the mind is deprived of oxygen in an existential crisis, the subject is likely to experience whatever they've been conditioned to expect, whether it's astral projection or spectral manifestations or a long dark tunnel or whatever. The longtime atheists who have either never had those expectations or have gotten over it tend not to have such experiences at all, while Hindus have profoundly different near-death experiences. Coming back to consciousness with claims of having met their gods and having proof of reincarnation, which of course contradicts the Christian accounts. And again, no one can show that their experience is any more valid or that they've really even experienced anything outside of their own culturally conditioned imaginations. 50 years of research into near-death experiences, and you've got a handful at best uh, of, of, of things that don't have a clear explanation and everything else doesn't even show that there's a there there. However, neither evolution nor Christianity can explain the rapid expansion of the early church. That is better explained by human corruption, because it started with a Jewish cult of renunciate leftist pacifist abstentionists and was incrementally altered to become a new and different religion of right-wing militant dominionists in pursuit of prosperity gospel. 
there is very little Christ left in Christianity anymore, a religion that I think Jesus would hardly recognize if you were alive today. But then that's fair. I think if Christians had a time machine, they wouldn't recognize or accept Jesus either. If your definition of atheism is merely that it's a lack of belief in God and you're just waiting to be convinced, but then you speak of him as though he's in some way synonymous with Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or fairies, doesn't that at least send the message to your listeners that you actually believe that there is no God? After all, these are entities and beings that you likely believe do not exist. And if your response is that you merely lack a belief in Santa Claus and don't actively believe that he does not exist, exist. Doesn't that sound a little disingenuous, honestly? No. The first authors to self-identify as atheists were Matthias Knudsen in 1674 and then Baron de Holbrock in 1772. And both of them defined atheism as being without theism, without belief in a god, a non-belief, not believing. And both of them made up other words to describe their subset of unbelievers who also held a belief that there is no god. Because those like myself who believe there is no God obviously still belong to the parent set of those who do not believe there is a God. It doesn't matter whether they also have a belief that there is no God. If some arrogant agnostic were to stand at the pearly gates and say, well, I don't have a belief that there is a God, but I don't have a belief that there's not one either. St. Peter would answer that by saying, to hell with you, atheist. Historically, way too many politicians and theologians have been obsessed with how we answer the simple yes or no question of whether we believe in God. Yes equals theist, in which case all may be forgiven, and no equals atheist, in which case we face the threat of a fate worse than death in the next life. But since we don't believe in that either, we will suffer prejudice and punishments in this life too, just to make sure that we do suffer for not believing whatever we were told to believe. When atheism becomes a part of someone's worldview, they typically change their positions on other issues like abortion, sexual morality, and a number of other things. I actually have several videos of well-known atheists saying that there's nothing wrong with prostitution, that they hope their children don't save themselves until marriage, and that sex workers should be put up on a pedestal no different than the military. I didn't use those here because I didn't want to seem combative to individuals, specifically the individuals who made those statements. We should have an objective standard, some way to determine whether something is or isn't moral, rather than having to inquire of the subjective opinion of some supposed authority, especially when that authority is pretending to convey God's subjective opinion on the matter. We need to know what criteria we can use to, to determine morality objectively. In general, I like the simple description given by Scott Clifton. That a particular action or choice is moral or right if it somehow promotes happiness, well-being, or health, or if it somehow minimizes unnecessary harm or suffering or both. And a particular action or choice is immoral or wrong if it somehow diminishes happiness, well-being, or health, or if it somehow causes unnecessary harm or suffering or both. Using such a standard, then any average person not only has the means whereby they could determine whether something is or isn't moral, but they can also understand the reason why it is or isn't. Notice also that this standard is universal, such that immoral people in every culture at any time in history already know innately when they're doing something that is wrong. So they look for excuses to justify their iniquities, usually by evoking religious or political prejudice to allow an exception for what is otherwise obviously evil even to them. And using that objective moral standard, we can see that many issues of sexual morality aren't really moral issues at all. If it's a mutual agreement between two consenting adults, and there's thus no victim, then why should anyone else care what they do? We should want our kids to be happy and find themselves in relationships that are mutually productive and satisfying. And many people in this country find themselves having a baby at 20 and then being divorced by 22. And they don't find their right person until they're well over 30. Generation after generation like that. Wouldn't it be better if teenagers were made aware of this trend uh, and, and given advice and counsel so that they could avoid falling into these patterns? 
We can also use this standard to answer the moral dilemmas like whether the rights of an unwanted, undeveloped fetus overrides a woman's right to bodily autonomy, especially in the case of an underage girl who, if she didn't have the wherewithal to consent to sex in the first place, then she certainly doesn't have the cognitive or physical maturity to consent to the resulting pregnancy and childbirth, and she shouldn't be punished for a choice she couldn't reasonably make or that was forced upon her. This standard also allows us to judge God and the Bible and the strange restrictions and prohibitions imposed on our upbringing to realize that none of these things were ever really moral to begin with. We should know better than that by now. But even if you didn't become an atheist just so you could sin, and I believe you, do you at least understand why those moves could send that message to people who might say that to you? No, because that is probably the single stupidest argument that has ever been made against atheism, and that's saying something. Think about it. It's one thing to pretend as if there is a God when you don't believe there is one, because you're hoping that the fear of the all-seeing eye of an inescapable, indomitable despot will somehow keep other people in line, even though we've already consistently seen that doesn't ever work. But imagine it the other way around. If we believed there is a God, but we pretend there isn't one just so we can do whatever we want, isn't that like pretending something is illegal? Uh, or pretending something is, is legal that we know isn't? Yeah, you, you're still going to get caught for that, right? And remember that God can and does see everything, according to the, you know, the sacred fables, say. Uh, even though he still never does anything when we need him to do so the most. And he both sees the future and he can read our minds, yet we're still supposed to pray to him as if he didn't already know everything we'll ever ask for. And he already knows whether he's just going to ignore us like he does the, the prayers of children being raped by one of his priests. So pretending as if God doesn't exist doesn't mean he can't see you doing whatever you do. And to think that way would be like the ravenous bug bladder beast of Troll, which is so mind-numbingly stupid, it thinks that if you can't see it, and it can't see you. Atheists are not mind-numbingly stupid. We are statistically smarter than believers on average. We already know that your God doesn't judge us over whether we are good or bad. If he did, then he would welcome atheists who are moral and would still object to the most devout believers who are immoral. Well, actually, no, because even if there was a God, there still wouldn't be a hell because no God would allow that. Hell is inconsistent with everything God is supposed to be or would be. But your sacred fables make clear that it doesn't matter how evil you are. All sins may be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are. Because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. Morality is therefore irrelevant. Only belief matters. And you're supposed to blindly believe all of these illogical, irrational absurdities claimed by the clergy, and to just swallow it all without question, reservation, or reason, simply because they said so, in lieu of any evidence for it, and regardless of all the evidence against it. Thus, gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. To believe there is a God, but pretend there isn't one, is stunningly stupid, because the only thing that really pisses God off is when you say that you don't believe in him. That's the one way to guarantee damnation without even a possibility of redemption. So if you love sin, whatever that means, be a Christian. Then you can sin all you want to and always be forgiven for it. Yeah, I know that apologists like William Lane Craig have said that when a person refuses to come to Christ, it is never because of a lack of evidence or because of intellectual difficulties, but that we supposedly fail to become Christians because we love darkness rather than light or because we want to sin. That's a lie. That's not true of everybody. I would even go so far as to say that that's not true of anybody, not to anyone ever. You become an atheist. That means you really just can't pretend anymore. We sincerely do not believe in any God at all, which means that we don't believe in sin either. That's why atheists also tend to be so much more moral than most Christians on average. If it's a lack of belief sort of atheism, what is it? Is it 50-50, 60-40, 75-25? And at what point do you feel disingenuous 
saying that you merely lack a belief as opposed to leaning towards, I believe that God does not exist. I know God doesn't exist. In general, a lack of belief means zero belief. Your percentages instead relate to how much probability we might award to what I see as a unsupported assertions of impossible absurdity. In my case, that probability is also zero. And there is literally no possibility to consider either. We can't say whether something is possible unless we have a precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such possibility exists. You don't have that for God. All you do have are empty assertions and illogical contradictions. I spent much of my life as an agnostic atheist, wherein I merely lacked evidence of God's existence amid growing distrust of the clergy and their assorted scriptures of lying scribes. However, while I still don't have a belief that there is a God, I now know enough to say that there is no God. I can say that I can't say that absolutely, of course, since God does exist in some capacity as a concept of the imagination of pretenders, but I can say that I know there is no God to the same degree and for the same reasons that I know that leprechauns don't exist. Do you understand enough to know that leprechauns don't exist? Now, I know we've all got our talking points, but I want you to struggle to be as sincere with yourself as you can right now. I find it laughably ironic that someone who is determined to make believe things that are not evidently true, who asserts baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact, pretending to know things no one even can know, which is what every faith is and does, that you would also pretend as if the unbeliever is the one who has to struggle to be honest. My experience has been that believers cannot be honest even when faced with the threat of perjury. Doesn't it bother you a little bit that when we come to talk about the origins of the universe, and if there's a multiverse, the origin of that too, that the only real options you've got besides God is a past infinite universe, which is impossible, or the universe coming to exist uncaused out of nothing, or something far less clear than even those? You say the only real options besides God, as if a deity is a real option. It's not. Gods and ghosts and devils and magical enchantments like blessings and curses and such are not real. Anytime you use the word supernatural in a sentence, you could replace that word with either magical or imaginary, and the sentence would be effectively unchanged. Worse, your God is defined by its miraculous nature. Miracles being defined as inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics, meaning that they are physically impossible, and thus your God is impossible by extension. Beyond that, I don't know any atheist alive who believes that everything came from nothing. Not even Lawrence Krauss believes that. But we all get accused of that all the time by creationists, people who really do believe in creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. So you're accusing us of believing what you believe. We don't. I've been fortunate enough to interview a number of cosmologists, and what I hear from them is that even in models of cosmogony that have a singularity, it is still eternal. Even if there was a time before cosmic inflation, there was never a time when the singularity did not already exist, or in the case of a big bang, big crunch sort of oscillation, at least the material energy within the singularity has always existed in some form and was never created. So an eternal universe is not impossible, like you said. If matter and energy were created, that would violate the first law of thermodynamics. So your position is impossible, but mine is fine and perfectly reasonable. It seems that for any worldview that includes atheism, there's a massive blind spot when it comes to the origin of the universe. And all the attempts to try and circumvent that problem seem desperate and at least far less likely than theism. I can't think of anything less likely than theism. The Pastafarian religion was invented in an attempt to illustrate how ridiculous that is, because blaming the universe on a magic invisible man is no different than blaming the flying spaghetti monster. But I have gone on record many times to say that I personally don't care how or if the universe had a beginning. It's irrelevant to me because whatever that answer is, it wouldn't change the fact that we are evolving apes and that our collective scriptures, all of them, are just man-made mythology with no truth in them. 
Not even the existence of God would change either of these facts. However, let me remind you that we used to think that epilepsy was demonic possession, that volcanoes were gods, and that comets were omens, and that dust devils were literally devils, and that air was spiritual, not material. We were never satisfied with that kind of nonsense, and so every time we ever blamed, blamed anything on the supernatural and later found out what it really was, it always turned out to be a revelation of whole new fields of study, previously unimagined and far more complex than the mystical excuses made up in our ignorance. So if we ever do find the one unambiguous explanation for the origin of at least this phase of our universe, that explanation will also be a fascinating discovery of such understanding as to render all our previous notions of gods and magic just as silly as everything else we've learned already has. My question isn't just what do you typically say about this, because I'm well aware of the responses. My question is simply this. When you step away from the debate mode that it's so easy for us all to get into online, doesn't this issue destabilize you a little bit? Of course not. How could it? We know and can prove that the Tower of Babel and the global flood of Noah's Ark, the Exodus, and many other stories in the Bible are not true and did not happen. Even Christian biologists admit that Adam and Eve are genetically impossible and that the Garden of Eden is just a fable adopted from multiple myths of mostly Mesopotamian polytheism adapted to a new religion. Likewise, we know and can show how evolution happens and that there are many ways to trace how it has happened throughout the distant past, disproving the, the sacred fables again. Even if it is logically impossible to prove that there is no God, we don't have to. Positive claims require positive evidence, and what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. Not only that, but we know we don't have souls either. Not just because we know that primitive people thought that the breath of life was spiritual, but because there is no support for mind-body dualism, neither in neuroscience nor even in philosophy right where the evidence definitely would be, right where there would be material evidence of the immaterial, if there was a supernatural aspect interacting with natural beings. That evidence isn't there. Instead, all we do have is evidence against it, enough to show that there is no such thing. It seems to fit really poorly with any worldview that includes atheism. Because you don't understand what atheism is. It's not the positive belief that the natural world is all there is, so much as it is accepting that there is a natural world and not also assuming a mystical aspect in addition to that, an alternative reality that is not supported by anything and it's contradicted by everything relevant to it. Of the arguments for God's existence, is there one that to you seems more interesting than the rest? Well, there are some that are so stupid that I feel embarrassment for the person who tried to make that argument. Like when believers realize there is no evidence for the exodus or the flood, or that there's evidence against these things, and they try to use the excuse that evidence is invalid either way because I can't prove that anything is real, that, that even I exist, or that I'm not just a brain in a vat somewhere. Maybe I was just invented two weeks ago or last Thursday with false memories, or that maybe God dreamt reality starting last Thursday. Matt Slick tried that stupidity on me. But if reality is real, then there is no evidence for these Bible stories and literally tons of rock-solid evidence against them. So we know the flood didn't happen in that case. And if reality is not real, if this is just a matrix illusion of last Thursdayism where we have false memories of a false history, then the flood didn't happen then either. So the Bible still isn't true. It's still wrong either way. Otherwise, apart from that and many other examples of bewildering inanity from the Wana pretenders, there's never been any argument for God that was interesting in any other way. Is there one that for you actually does weigh in favor of theism? Which one? None. Every single argument for God, even the ones that Christians and Muslims say that are their best arguments, like the Kalam cosmological argument, Anselm's ontological argument, Paley's watchmaker, Pascal's wager, Every one of them amounts to a false premise or a straw man or a circular argument routing back to an assumed conclusion. The question-begging fallacy that is ubiquitous throughout religion. 
every faith, uh, coupled with arguments from ignorance and incredulity. Look up a list of logical fallacies online and notice that every one of them has been used as an argument for God, and every argument for God is a logical fallacy. Most atheists I've met humbly admit that they don't think they can have absolute certainty about much of anything. We also understand how deceptive it can be to be convinced of absolute certainty. Faith is an unreasonable certainty that is inherently auto-deceptive, and it's the most dishonest position to have, which is why it's always wrong in every instance that can be tested. So we figured out that it's better to avoid faith. If you, wanted, if you want to find the truth of anything, the first thing you've got to do is abandon faith. It's better to be appropriately reserved, if possible. But what they want from the Christian is a demonstration that God exists or that Christianity is true. Well, when we offer the reasons to believe that we do have, those are typically deemed not good enough. So what sort of evidence, if any, would be enough to convince you? Do you know? I'll accept anything that qualifies as evidence. Any body of objectively verifiable facts that are positively indicative of and or exclusively concordant with one available position or hypothesis over any other. Every single time a believer has ever tried to offer evidence, it's always been limited to frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies. And since it's often a conversation stopper, let's take experimental reproducibility off the table, since that's not even always necessary for science. This is where I have to explain to believers why arguments are not evidence. That evidence is popularly defined as a fact that indicates. So it first has to be a fact, something we both show to be true. Then we can look at whether it also indicates only one conclusion or eliminates another. Because if the same fact would still be true in both cases, then it can't be evidence of either one. And so far, no one has ever presented even one thing that was verifiably true and indicative of a God. Nothing, ever. It's always either not been indicative or it's not even been true. And so far, the best I've ever heard were facts that were better accounted for by evolution or secular philosophy. To what extent did social and moral issues start you down the path toward your atheism? That is to say, the typical Christian or religious views on sexuality, gender, rights, and acts and commands of God in the Old Testament. For me, it wasn't any of that. I was lied to a lot. I was lied to about science all the time. I was lied to about what other religions believe and what atheism is and what God is and what the Bible is. I was told that it was the word of God and that God is love and wisdom and all of that. So that if I were to read the Bible, I would tap into the most amazing mind imaginable. But, you know, you won't get very far in the Bible before you see that none of that is true. The Bible is a haphazard compilation of raving inanity from inferior beings, not a superior one. I still believed in God for a few years after that, but there was no way I could believe in the Bible. Or that, I, or that I could believe that God had anything to do with the composition of the Bible. And without that, though, I read other scriptures, too, and found no wisdom there, either. And the notion of God began to fail on its own lack of merit. Because God was always something that just didn't fit with anything else. Certainly not with everything else. I mean, the universe doesn't really make coherent sense until you stop trying to squeeze a God into it. It seems that many deconversion stories online begin with, or at least include, LGBT issues, purity culture, or hell as instrumental in the deconversion process. It strikes me that what should matter most is the truth and not what we might prefer that the truth were. I agree, absolutely. In fact, that is my worldview. I don't want to be fooled into believing anything that isn't evidently true, because where's the value in that? Only accurate information has practical application. And I don't just want to believe what is true either. I want to understand it. I want to improve my understanding. And the only way to do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perspective and correct them. You can't do that if you can't admit that there even could be flaws needing correction. So the truth matters to me more than whatever I might rather believe. Whereas self-professed believers take the opposite stance, that they need to defend the faith regardless what the truth is. So, when they need to believe something that they already know is not true, they simply lie about it. And I can show myriad examples of that. 
In fact, I wrote a 400 plus page book listing a lot of those lies. Just to avoid making those falsehoods myself, I have learned that the truth is what the facts are, what we can show to be true, not whatever else we might assume or imagine beyond or instead of that, which is the realm of religion. I won't pretend to know things I don't know, like believers always do. I know better than to say that anything is true or the truth until I can show the, the, the truth of it, the evidence that justifies the conclusion. I don't just want to be able to distinguish fact from falsehood. I want to improve my understanding. And that means that for me, the only value information can have is in however accurate we can show it to be. But if it can't be shown to be accurate at all, then it has no value at all. If it can't be indicated or vindicated, verified or falsified, then it doesn't even warrant further consideration. So there goes the vast majority of sermons and all of our assembled scriptures of every religion into the trash heap. Because every claim that every faith makes falls into one of two categories. It's either not evidently true or it's evidently not true. If you can't show the truth of it, then there is no truth to it. And that's all that matters. I honestly wonder how much those issues and ones like them motivate the deconversion rather than all this talk about evidence. I think I can answer that. There was an informal poll done at one of the American Atheist National Conventions where most atheists in this country were raised Christian. The poll inquired uh, as to the catalyst that cost them their faith. Scientific evidence was in third place. The second most popular answer was the hypocrisy of the church or the clergy, which I guess is what you just alluded to. But the number one answer for why American Christians became atheists is that they read the Bible. That's what did it for me, too. I remember when Penn Jillette said that we should read the Bible cover to cover because we need more atheists and nothing will get you there faster than reading the damn Bible. Can you name the last three academic books you read by theists on the subject? How long ago did you read them? Or is most of your understanding of apologetics and atheism from non-scholarly internet sources, pop-level books, and... Let's face it, YouTube videos. And be honest with yourself about this. Anyone can Google up a list of books and paste them in the comments section. But I want to know, are you getting the best from the other side? Oh, definitely. But well, that isn't saying much. Your very best isn't very good. And I haven't read many books that were written by theists for the purpose of apologetics. So I have read some, usually as a young man at my mother's insistence, like Emmanuel Velikovsky, for example, and Eric von Däniken. Otherwise, as an adult, I've read quite a lot from St. Augustine, Aquinas, Descartes, William Lane Craig, and so on. But any argument that wasn't just madness, empty, unsupported, and indefensible assumptions of baseless and dishonestly asserted as if it was a matter of fact. In other words, lies. And that's the best you all have, because that's all you have. Let's finish with a pretty common one. If you found out today to your satisfaction that Christianity were true, would you accept God's authority, repent of your sins, and trust Jesus as your king? Of course not. Jesus would not be my king, and I don't have any sins to repent. And, as Carl Sagan pointed out, arguments from authority are worthless. If I ask a question, it's because I want to understand something. So the reply that because I said so, is never going to qualify as an answer. If Christianity is true, then nothing means anything anymore, literally. I mean, facts can't be evidence in that case, since it just we already have all the facts we need against this, and if, you, if we're going to assume that Christianity is true, we may as well assume that we're living in a cartoon world. And there is no hope either, because even if I got into heaven, it would still become an insufferable damnation soon enough because it goes on forever and ever and ever. And there would be no way to just let it end. I mean, you can't always ascend or improve or learn more forever and ever or get better at everything. It, 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 there's only so far you can go. And we're talking about eternity here. So may as well go to hell. At least I would find better company there. Or, if the wages of sin is death, 
wherein I could finally die completely, like everything else does, like we're supposed to. Then show me how to sin. And I promise I'll sin enough to pay extra. Because given the choice between that and an eternal afterlife in heaven or anywhere, I would literally rather die. 